And I, I feel a bit nervous speaking to you all because we're all on our transformation journey and everybody's got a story to tell. But anyway, I'm just going to tell you mine, or not just mine, obviously it's Shepherd's story. So it's not just a council story, it's a Shepherd's story. So I'm just going to cover very briefly why, how, and then some of the lessons we've learned. Um, <laughs> uh, Sarah's more or less given me all my, you know if you get an essay when you're doing an exam and they say, right, these are the key words you've got to build into your essay. Well, Sarah's given me all the key words in her presentation already. I don't think we can say too much about Christy. We should never forget Christy. As far as I'm concerned, we've said it all and we've really ignored him far too long. <laughs> um, Shetland, so where are we? Well, we're far, much further north than some people think, but since recent legislation and Tavish Scott, bless him, we now can't be put in a box on a map. We have to actually be shown right up there on the same latitude as Bergen, which is actually our nearest railway station. Um, we have 23,000 people. There are 100 islands, would you believe, 15 populated, and of those, some fixed links, bridges, no tunnels yet, although the members, would be, the members of the council would dearly love to have tunnels. Um, 15 populated, some of those island populations are very small, below 50, tiny, um, and it gets wild up there. I know you've had it wild down here, but it does get wild up there. We have an ageing population, but it's ageing differently <coughs> than some of these islands, so we have some islands with an incredibly ageing population. However, I do twitch slightly, the only thing I've twitched at in your presentation. When people talk about the working age population, excuse me, what do we mean by that these days? Um, why do we talk to people as soon as they're 50 and going grey? Well, um, when are you going to retire? I just turned 62, I have absolutely no intention of retiring whatsoever, although I am enjoying my bus pass and the council is benefiting from the um, free bus rides. Um, Reserves. Loads of people would love to have Shetland's oil money. The council has, at the last reckoning, £375 million pounds of reserves. What that means is we set next year's budget, which is around about 80, 100 million, is we can put £14 million pounds into our revenue budget next year as a sustainable draw on those reserves. Now, wouldn't you all give your eye teeth for that? So, um, and if you think about it in proportion, how much it, would it be for your councils? A lot more than 14 million. But everybody's desperate to spend it. They keep saying, well, you've got all that money. Can't we just have a bit of it for this, a bit of it for that? And we won't draw that graph. But you can imagine at the moment, the idea is to keep it sustainable. I'll go and start the up. As soon as you start doing that, it's not long before you're off the cliff. And that nearly happened to us. That nearly happened to us in 2010-11, and lo and behold, even though it's Shetland Reserves, and Shetland should be able to decide what to do with it, we ended up in all sorts of bother with Audit Scotland and the Accounts Commission who came to see us, and Professor James Mitchell told this batch of elected members, if you do that again, you won't get off with it, somebody will come and take you over, because it is a misuse of public money. So, that's a real challenge. So having that money is a great benefit, but it's a huge challenge because the expectations, my goodness, if you think you've got high expectations, try Shetland. They think the council should do everything and for free and some. So, and we have some unsustainable services because the services we've created on the back of that money are to die for. People who move to Shetland, you can tell I'm not a native Shetlander, I come from Manchester. People who move to Shetland are absolutely astonished at the level of services and the quality of services that Shetland provides. So, why do we need to change before we go back? Uh, and how are we going to do it? Well, we're going to do our partnership plan. We're going to do it together. I've only brought one copy, but you're very welcome to have a look at it and pass it round. So we're going to do it through our partnership plan. And in our partnership plan, we have four priorities. Four seems to be a good number for priorities. We have four priorities. I've just picked out the people one. And what we're doing in here is we're highlighting some of the key things in terms of challenges for Shetland, why we need to change, how we compare with other people. And there are some quite stark ones. 
So, <coughs> yes, health and wellbeing life expectancy generally better than the Scottish average. I should mention it's a lot better than Glasgow, haven't got recently, but there you go. Um, but children in Shetland living in low income families, the figure's fairly static. Why, why is that? Why aren't we doing better than that? Shetland Food Bank distributes more and more food parcels, so inequalities and poverty is growing in Shetland. Thinking back to all our money and the amount we can support for the community, how can that be? Um, and this one, the proportion of child protection cases involving alcohol and drug misuse is three times the national average three times the national average. So Shetland, wonderful place to live. You think of it as a wonderful, safe place for children, families, people to grow up, but huge alcohol problem. <coughs> and three times the proportion of child protection cases down to drug and alcohol misuse. Really stark, not what you want. 20% of people drink at potentially harmful levels compared to 17.8% in Scotland. And we've been working on this for decades. We talk about generational changes in things like child protection, how do we break the cycle. Well, we've had a cycle. We've had more than a cycle working on these issues. And in some respects, they're getting worse. 49% of households in Shetland do not earn enough to live well. So this is why we have to change. So how? How are we going to do it? Well, we have a business transformation program. Ta-da! So it has a number of work streams. It's been going for two years. We numbered the work streams, and the first one was customer first. So putting the population, the citizen at the heart of everything we do. Looking at commissioning and procurement, trying really hard not to just thoughtlessly keep redoing the same thing, retendering, so it comes back to that, let's not do what we've always done or we'll get what, you know the rest. So it's about being totally innovative and doing things differently. Workforce development, workforce strategy and plan, looking at different ways to do things. We're actually going to launch in January a new graduate placement programme, and that's to provide project officer resources for our transformation programmes. Who better <coughs> could you want than wonderful, <coughs> enthusiastic, clever young people to come and populate and do the research, analysis, stakeholder engagement, and developing options for your transformation programmes. So we're going to launch that in January. Rationalising our accommodation, because we've had so much money, we've had loads of developments, and offices, public buildings, and so on, so we're cutting back. And recently, we actually did something quite innovative. This, this is the sort of thing where lots of rules get in your way. You know, it's really unfortunate about the law sometimes. Um, I actually am responsible for governments and law in the council, but sometimes I wish I could just, you know, scrub a few out and erase it there. <laughs> um, accommodation rationalisation. We bought, we bought out a local Shetland Leasing and Property Agency. We bought it out. And what I, it was a really hard pick because the member said, oh, well, what properties did you get and what you don't want? Wow, that's a horrible building. We're saying, no, 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 just a minute. You've 370 million pounds invested in all sorts of things. You haven't a clue what they're invested in. They're invested in property portfolios all over the shop. The only thing you know you're not investing in is tobacco because you've taken that decision. But you haven't a clue that think of this as an investment in a property portfolio. Look at how much it generates. Look at the, the finances of it. And actually, the deal we struck means we get 10% on that property portfolio. Well, that's better than any return on any of our other investments. On the long term, we plan to get between 7 and 8% on all our reserves. We've just bought something that will give us 10%. So that's actually worth £1.7 million pounds a year to us. And we own the property. <coughs> So what's not to like? And some of them means we can actually completely rationalise our economy.
accommodation in Shetland and get it down. Now, the thing we need to do within that is this whole thing about um, 10 people to seven desks. We're not there yet because everybody's had it so good for so long. They don't know what to do. I should really say it. So broadband, we need broadband. No, do we need broadband? Is the Scottish government listening? Well, way back they said something about we're going to start from the outside, we're going to do outside in because the most remote places need the most. So the highlands, the islands. And then they looked and saw how much it was going to cost. And then lo and behold, they said, Ooh, well, that means it might not be very commercially this, that, and the other attractive to all the people that would do it. So we knew. And so where are we in the programme? Goodness knows. And what happens is the year that they're going to have our 100 buyers now slipped a year and weren't fully expected. So broadband, what a difference that would make in these tiny island populations, especially with the people who live. Digital first. <coughs> we need the new rule of thumb. We want all our citizens to be able to do all their business, get services with the council through their mobile device, whatever it is. So digital first, so digital transformation. New website, new everything. We're on it. We're going to have a new website soon. We're going to get rid of, I don't know whether other councillors have had this, an internet and an intranet. And on your intranet, you have all your inside stuff and you don't share it with everybody. I'm going to scrap that. We're just going to have the internet. And then we'll make sure that we cover things with security, bits and bobs if people can't share. But we're just going to have the internet. We have one thing, totally open, publish everything. I do have this argument with other senior managers. We at one time had on our management team a colleague who wanted to publish nothing. Uh, and he wanted to publish everything. Anyway, the publish everything lobby is winning. Hooray. This should all help the data, the using intelligence, all the stuff that Sarah's done. Information management, GDPR, asset um, reg asset information re inf blah, registers. We now know what data we've got. So it would be criminal not to use it. So we're going to do that. Performance management and reporting, linking to commissioning and procurement. It's all a plan, do, study, <coughs> isn't it? Every time. And you just have to keep going around it. And not this bit in the spring and this bit in the fall. It has to be the whole time. I'm sure in your normal everyday life, you're thinking the whole time about, well, maybe we could do this next year, or maybe this tomorrow. We don't work like that in everyday life, so why do we work in that kind of rigid thinking mode in our work life? So that's business job. Then we have a service redesign program. So this is by each of our main four departments. We have a whole range of things on the go, some incredibly challenging ones, some we could well do without. Um, I believe there is one person from Scottish Government here. If he's, if he isn't um, hiding already, then uh, early learning and childcare, and the however many hours it is we now have to offer to every person. <coughs> we can't give away the hours we already provide, but we have to take the money the Scottish Government has now given us to expand that offering across the whole of Shetland in tiny remote places building new bits onto various properties because that isn't where the accommodation is that we've now got in our wonderful portfolio. To, order, to offer even more hours to all the families who don't want what we're already offering. That doesn't seem to be a Christy solution to me, but hey, there we go. And so stuff going on there. Digital e-school is really exciting. Western hours have really led the way on that, and that could be really transformational for Shetland. Fantastic. Development, they've really got their work cut out because we still have a college that we run, a council owned and run college, and a council owned and run training facility separately from that college. And there is the North Atlantic Fisheries College, which is a charitable trust set up, and all three are kind of siloing the way to themselves. And so we've now decided we need to put it all together. Now that's that's a hard bit. That's been on the go for about, <coughs> it depends where you start counting from. Well, anything up to 10 years, we've been trying to do that in various guises to get it worked together. Crucial decision point next week. I can't wait. Um, health and social care. Review of locality services. Our locality services are astonishing. <coughs> and our top level indicators for health and care are some of the best across Scotland, which of course means they are some of the best across the UK, which means of course they're probably about the best in the world, which means we have fewer people stuck 
in, in, in Lonsdale Hospital with closed hospital beds, with closed hospital wards. We, across our islands, have got hubs where we can offer a range of services. The idea being, there's the need, there's the service, get on with it. Prevention, early intervention, working well. But it costs, so how do we make it sustainable? Telehealth care, all these sorts of things. But huge pieces of work. Mental health is a problem, a lot linked to alcohol. How do you do prevention there? Don't treat the mental health, deal with the alcohol. Infrastructure, complete review, waste recycling. Our waste recycling, you, you couldn't make it up. We, we, we developed this whole thing on Shetland whereby you could burn all your rubbish locally rather than ship it away or put it in landfill. Um, but anyway, that means you're not doing much recycling. Some of the best stuff to do that with is plastics. So that won't do. So Scottish government targets, is the Scottish government guy still in the room? Scottish government targets on recycling mean that that won't do. So now we have to do loads of recycling. But recycling, it means we have to ship it away. And now, what do we do with our waste energy plant where we burn rubbish? Well, we're probably going to have to ship rubbish in to burn it. You know it makes sense. So, where's Christy? Um, anyway, so, business transformation. But we're, we're, we're pegging away, and we've got an Islands Act. Now, if we use that Islands these are some of the things where if we can do a business case and really do, whoops, and really do the outcome-focused stuff, we ought to be able to make a sound business case, strategic, economic, financial management that stacks up, and then with the Islands Act, be able to, to argue that that may work brilliantly for Glasgow, but it's not going to be for Shetland, actually. So, Islands Act. But anyway, so in terms of how partnership working, Shetland Partnership Delivery Plans, the thingies going around, there'll be delivery plans, and initially we're talking about four delivery plans for our priorities, people, place, money, and participation. I'm leading the participation one. So my argument is, whoa, 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 why are we doing it four plans? Surely these four plans should be totally interlinked, because actually what we should have at the centre is the people, and my work stream of participation should be working hand in glove with that. So I'm really fortunate because the local head of the police service in Shetland is leading the people, and he and I are on the same place, so we're going to do that and we're going to make sure it all comes together. So, Shetland Partnership Delivery Plans. The IJB, I love the IJB, I'm sorry, my bubble <coughs> slipped. I do apologize. <coughs> I should say the latest iteration of joint working between health and care, but will it be the last? You remember that Community Care Act in the early 90s? And then we had modernising community care, and then we had joint future, joint future, one joint future. Called it joint futures because what did we end up with? <coughs> joint futures give a dog a bad name. We should always have called it joint future one, well, but we didn't. CHP, so what happened? We had an Audit Scotland report that said it was <coughs> rubbish, and everybody else that didn't like them and hated change and was stuck and wanted to be stuck got on the bandwagon and said, Oh, the rubbish, the rubbish, the rubbish. So they were doomed, as Private Fraser would have said. But anyway, um, so what did we get then? We got a new act. Public Bodies Act, thank you. So we got the Public Bodies Act. And you can make it work, but it is convoluted and it is tough going, but you can make it work. Now, now all these people say you can't pull budgets. You can, you could pull budgets way back in after the first legislation in the 90s. But what you need to do that is a plan. You need a plan and you need to be able to show that you're delivering your outcomes and that you're fulfilling your duties of being accountable. What you need to be able to do. If you can do that, you can pay money to whoever you like. Whether it's <coughs> how, how sensible would it be to be able to put money into a private firm to deliver care to meet your outcomes, but you couldn't put money into the NHS to do activities that were going to contribute to your outcomes. Of course, you could, it just didn't seem like you could, and you can't just give them the money because they're hard up. So Islands Act, we're now on an Islands deal, that's a big challenge. And then of course we're all in the middle of the review of local governance, which could be an enormous distraction, but hopefully what it will do, and the sessions that I've been involved in so far, 
um, which Professor James Mitchell is, is helping pull together. We'll be looking at this idea of Christy being local, being appropriate for different situations, not one size fits all. So fingers crossed that will help us rather than hindering what we're trying to do. So lessons learned, change is challenging. Change by me for me is good. Who here hasn't, at some point this week, and it's only Tuesday, <coughs> thought about, well, if I could change this, that, and the next, be it, you know, your hair colour, your dentist, your doctor, you might want to change them the whole time, all these sorts of things, or a new, whatever it is, or the chairs in the diner, anything. You're, we all do it the whole time. Why is it when we get into work, we go, and we want to be frozen in time and carry on doing what we've always done. Well, we shouldn't. So, the trick is change by me is good for me, for instance, where I'm in these notes. I did have some notes at this point because one of the things we're now trying to do is to get it so that all our staff and all the community can be involved in change. So, if we draw, pretend this is a big hill, and pretend, although we would never be doing this, that we are a, <coughs> a warring nation. Right, so the leader would be at the top in the old days, so that's the little mountain or whatever, because from there you can see everywhere around the mountain, behind it, round everywhere. But, unless he's got extremely good spectacles, or a telescope, you can't see much of what's going on down here. It's too far away. So why do we always have people at the top of an organisation making the decisions about all sorts of stuff? We talk so much about empowering the front line. But what you find as well, people such as myself, I'm not up here, so let's say this is our chief executive, chief executive, Right? So she's up there, but I'm kind of here. Whoops. It's part four. But this is me. It's not the sun. This is me. Squash. Um, anyway, so I'm here. <coughs> My view is like that. I can't see around there at all. I actually can't see around there. I can see a bit more of what's here. This is a lot clearer to me. And so on, down the way. So how do we make that work? Has anybody tried communicating by cascading? <laughs> doesn't work, does it? Yes, no, no, it doesn't. So what do you do? So we need a network. So the idea is to try and create a network whereby people are linked. By <coughs> now, this could look nearly like the national grid or a telephone network. And what have we got? Digital transformation. Yes. So we should be using it all. And we should have nodes where people can come together. So let's imagine this is Shetland. The idea would be then that everything is connected. We can use all our technology. We can use all our, um, uh, all our people that are at different places in here, as long as we all talk to one another, to get the whole picture, but to get the whole picture seen by everybody, not just by this person, but a long way away, but by everybody able to appreciate what's going on and understand life, the universe, and everything. And in among here, we need the third sector, we need our private sector, and we need citizens. So every group that already exists, every person that already exists, we want to hear from them. That might be why they put me in charge of participation. So, the idea is that, in terms of participation, I've got two big themes that I want to cover. One is making sure every voice is heard. We all talk about the hard-to-reach groups. In Shetland, somebody knows that person, whether it's the postman, the shopkeeper, the whoever it is. I want to be able to, through those nodes around the whole thing, get that intelligence and use it, which is about using the data. But what I also want to do, because in Shetland we have very poor 
um, participation in community councils. So recently it was community council elections and there were no contested <coughs> places in our community councils. And we nearly lost three through not having enough people to actually make them up. Now community councils, one statutory duty is to represent the community and provide information and intelligence to local authorities. So what's not to like about community councils? So we have to make sure there are key nodes in our web that's going to give us that intelligence. And the other thing we need to do is to promote um, the council as a good place to be and the health board and we need to get more of that representative feel about Shetland whereas at the moment it tends to be a small number of people that turn up in the same place as the whole time. I'd imagine that's quite similar across the country, but it, it seems to be particularly prevalent. So there's that specific project to do things like that, but then the big thing for me is to make sure that we try and get every voice heard through everything we do, looking at people, place, money, participation, and of course we have to have a locality on the which you see. So, Change is good for me, uh, blah, 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 all of that. The other thing we're doing around staff is the lens. Has anybody else come across the lens? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so we're, we're trying to get the lens working. In Shetland, we have three big trusts, one for the arts, one for um, museum archives, and one for sport and leisure, and they're collaborating to use the lens. And the idea of the lens is that it really promotes and upskills your workforce so that they, so again we're talking about everybody at this level is really in among it, in the thick of what's going on, um, to, to come forward with their ideas. Now we tried this years ago, we did the typical thing, management thought it'd be great to get staff suggestions, you get a whole lot of staff suggestions, you collate them all, you discard 99.9% .9 and you do the 0.1%. And you end up with a whole lot of things that thinks nothing they ever say is listened to or anything's done with it. So, so we thought, well, that's not a really good idea. So, but this is different because they come with their proposals, they present their proposals, they get money and set off to do it themselves. So it's a really involved process. So we're really excited about this. And the idea is you put together a fund uh, for different things. Now, Shetland, with all its money, we actually have two, but three budgets, actually, that I loved bits. We have a change fund where you can put forward proposals for change. So, lo and behold, we've already got a far bigger fund than the lens ever aspires to have, sitting there waiting to be used for our change programs. That's going to fund our graduate placements for our project. We also have spend to save, so that's the purely economic one. Can you actually demonstrate with it, you get payback and then on you go. And we have a capital change fund. Set aside within our capital programme, we have a capital. <coughs> so, using the lens, but setting out a specific chunk of that money for people to bid for with their own ideas and then get them to implement them, that's what we're really trying to do. And we're building that up through our values, so coming back to workforce development, we had staff coming forward to develop the council's values. Our values are, three of them, excellent service, working well together, and taking personal responsibility. So the idea being every single person in the organisation can be a leader, and the lens is very much about unlocking that potential in the workforce. So, but all dab habits do die hard. <coughs> Families are alive and kicking. Um, you know, I, I even yesterday met somebody from Health and Care who was talking to me about our capital programme service and our building maintenance service and saying that she wanted to get them in the room and bang their heads together. And I thought, this is ridiculous. So anyway, we'll hopefully get sort of that. People clinging to their wooden spoons. I've told a story ages ago of a cook in one of the tiny, tiny, tiny schools. We've had great fun with those. I suppose they used to serve traditional Shetland fare, re-stick mutton and um, mince and tatties and such like. And this uh, cook had her wooden spoon. And somebody came in from the, you know, the, you must do all whole meal flour and you must do this and all these menus and what it was to be nutrition and, and chastise her, chastised her for having a wooden spoon because um, it's not very hygienic to have a wooden spoon and she clutched it to her ample bosom and said well I haven't poisoned anybody yet you're not having the wooden spoon 
And so people came to the wooden spoons. Fear and lack of trust, we all know about that. Uncertainty. Brexit. Now, Brexit's wonderful because in Shetland now we're doing all our resilience planning and one of the big fears is how we're going to starve to death. So we're putting together, believe it or not, a plan um, that shows that we can survive in Shetland because we have sheep, we grow tatties and neeps, and we can fish. So we'll be all right. <laughs> Nothing much grows apart from tatties and neeps, but you can live on them. So we'll be all right. And if people want to come and raid us for our sheep and our tatters and our neeps and our fish, well, we'll just stop the ferry coming. <laughs> and we'll be fine. So that's Brexit. But joking apart, um, Churchill feared submarines because they would do away with the convoys that brought food because Britain does not produce enough food for its population. So joking apart, if all the real doom mongers about Brexit are right, we might actually have a food crisis. Because a lot of food travels across the channel. But hopefully not. One year from the Young Hedges. Now, there's two sides to that. I appreciate one year from the Young occupations can seem really difficult and short sighted. But on the other hand, if somebody asked me to do a plan now, could do a very detailed plan for next week. My plan for next month would be a bit less. And then for next year, but I could do one for 20 years, I could do one for 50 years, but the uncertainty gets bigger. That doesn't mean to say I shouldn't plan. That doesn't mean to say that I should just become completely <coughs> paralyzed because I'm only getting one year funding or I can't see what's happening with Brexit. So we mustn't stop, we must plan. So, lessons learned, what we need. Open dialogue, everybody talking to one another. Everybody sharing. Shared vision, or whatever it's got to, gives us that. So we don't want child protection to still be a huge issue. We don't want inequalities and poverty growing in Shepherd. We don't want that. So we know what we don't want, so what does good look like? And then we need a smart plan, and we need to get on with it. And to do that, we need strong, collaborative leadership. And the Improvement Service is going to help us with all of that. So it's all good. And you're all going to help me with all of that. If I can help you in any way with all of that, I'll do that too. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.